It is officially game day, folks. What does Gonzaga need to do to avoid falling victim to a 12-5 upset at the hands of McNeese State? It's all going to start with the big man in the middle. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Thursday, happy game day, and welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Have you ever wondered what adventure could be just around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Folks, it is the first time in Gonzaga basketball history they are a five seed in the NCAA tournament. We know that 12-5 upsets are always trendy picks. We know the national media has a lot of folks picking against Gonzaga in this one. We're going to discuss what are my five keys to a Gonzaga victory. What can they do to ensure they are still playing basketball on Saturday? We'll get to that. We're also going to look at the rest of Thursday's action, other games going on in this Midwest region, some other games going on elsewhere in the NCAA tournament that have some Gonzaga flair, including a matchup between two former Gonzaga coaches. We'll talk about that. We'll also close out the show talking about the transfer portal. Like I said, if the Gonzaga coaching staff has to split time focused on the NCAA tournament and the transfer portal in solidarity, I will do the same as well. Talk about the transfer portal while also talking about the NCAA tournament. But of course we lead getting you fully finally ready here for this matchup against Will Wade and the Cowboys of McNeese State. We've talked about them a handful of times in the other episodes this this week, talked about them on Monday, talked about them a lot more on Wednesday as well. But we're going to talk more here, less, less about the actual McNeese team. Most of that conversation happened on Wednesday's episode. Today, I want to focus on what does Gonzaga need to do to win? Uh, as a reminder, the game will be at 425 p.m. Pacific time on Thursday on TBS. The game is taking place in Salt Lake City. Right now, FanDuel favors the Zags by five and a half points. Five keys. If you've been listening to the podcast throughout the season, you've probably heard a lot of the same or similar keys for Gonzaga to ensure a victory. And one of them is for Graham E.K. to not only stay on the floor, but to stay on the floor and dominate offensively. And in this game, more than almost any other game, more than any other game that Gonzaga has played this year, that is a key critical element for two reasons. Number one, McNeese doesn't have a lot of size. You don't typically expect teams in the Southland Conference to have a ton of size. That's just not, you know, bigger players who are skilled enough to play at the D1 level are probably going to other programs, other conferences. And that is the case here with McNeese. Very good, very talented team. Obviously, you don't win 30 wins. You don't earn 30 wins by accident. But this team doesn't have anybody in their rotation over six foot seven. Their tallest listed player is Antavion Collum. Their leading rebounder is a six foot six guard. This is a, a good defensive team, but they are not a big team. Graham E.K. is bigger, he is stronger, taller, longer than every player on this McNeese team. And that needs to be taken advantage of. The basketball needs to go to Graham E.K. on every half-court possession that it that he is on the floor. There is no excuse outside of a, you know, Ryan Nempard crossing his guy over and getting an easy lay-in or a wide-open three-pointer. There's really no excuse for the ball not to be going to Graham E.K. every time that it can. If McNeese packs it way in, doubles him immediately on touches, he's got to be able to kick it out, swing the ball around, look for an open three-point shot. But you got to at least try to be getting the ball to Graham. This is a decent rebounding team. They don't block a lot of shots, though. So for Graham, I think going over the top, trying to score through that contact, potentially trying to get to the free throw line again. He's an 81% free throw shooter lately. So I think that's a huge part of this game. But the other element is kind of on the other end of the floor. Graham has to stay out of foul trouble. Gonzaga has lost games because of Graham E.K.'s foul trouble. That has been a big problem for this team this year. The flip side, McNeese, very good at getting to the free throw line. They're not very good at converting from the free throw line. They are a sub-70% free throw shooting team, but they draw a lot of contact. 
they have a high rate of their points come from the charity stripe. Shahada Wells, former TCU point guard, he is very good at slowing the pace, lulling the defense, putting the ball on the deck, putting some pressure on the rim, and forcing defenses to either foul him and put him on the free throw line or give up lay-ins at the rim. Gonzaga is not a great rim-protecting team, so that is going to be a factor. Wells is going to try to get to the rim, try to get to the cup. I don't expect EK and Huff and those guys to be erasing shots left and right. They're not Chet Holmgren's. That's not who they are. But what they have to do is avoid fouling. If that means you give up some buckets in that situation, fine. If it becomes too much of a problem, you got to sag off, make McNeese beat you from beyond the arc, which I think they'll ultimately end up uh, trying for Gonzaga, I mean. But if you let Wells continually get to the rim, you're putting a lot of pressure on your bigs to contest those shots without fouling. If Graham's spending 8, 10, 12 minutes in the first half on the bench because of early foul trouble, that is a big problem for Gonzaga. As a reminder, Graham E.K. since that Kentucky game, 20 points, 7 boards, 62% from the field. Been absolutely excellent for over a month now. That needs to continue in this one. Key number two, need to see that consistency, that excellence from Ryan Nempard Gonzaga as a team. They need to take care of the basketball. In the last eight games, this has been Ryan Nembhard's stats, 15 and a half points per game, 9.1 assists, five rebounds, one and a half steals, and just 2.1 turnovers. That is phenomenal. Nine to two assist to turnover ratio in the last eight games, 15, nine, and five. I mean, that is excellent, excellent level of production. Beyond that, 42% from three. If you tuned into the first part of Gonzaga's season and you kind of lulled out during the WCC and you're back here trying to get a preview for this game, Ryan Nembhard is not the same player that you saw in the non-conference portion of the season. If national media members are, are listening to this show and they uh, were talking about, oh, like, who's the better guard in this, in this game, Shahada Wells or Ryan Nembhard? With no disrespect to Wells, anybody saying that, anybody pushing that narrative probably hasn't watched Ryan Nembhard since December because he's playing like one of the best point guards in the entire country. And in a game where you're playing a team that forces more turnovers than almost every team in college basketball, this is what McNeese does. They force turnovers. They're very good at this. Now we talked about their strength of schedule. We talked about how this is a team that didn't really play anybody particularly good. They only played one other NCAA tournament team this year. That was a 12 seed in UAB. They only played one team in the top 100 at Ken Palm. That was VCU. So yes, the turnover, the forcing turnover numbers may be a bit inflated by the quality of the opponents that they play, but that does not mean that Ryan Nempard and Nolan Hickman can be in any way flippant with the basketball. This is in a critical game for them to take really good care of it. And again, we, we mentioned Nemhard too. Not it's not just gonna, we mentioned Hickman too. It's not just going to fall on Nemhard. Hickman in the last eight games has been incredible as well. Sixteen points, three point eight assists, but just zero point eight turnovers in the last eight games. Nolan Hickman thirty one assists and six turnovers. If these two guards can take care of the basketball, get this team into their half court offense, avoid careless turnovers, huge boost for the team's ability to win this one. Key number three, you got to knock down open shots. And folks, I have to an issue, an apology for a stat that I miss, uh, misread, mis, uh, misdiscussed on this podcast earlier this week. I said that McNeese allows teams to shoot 48% from three. That is not true. They allow 48% of their opposing team's points to come from the three-point line, which is still a very bad number for them. Granted, they actually hold teams to a much better three-point percentage, around 32%. So that is a big difference. And I apologize for getting that incorrect on a previous episode. McNeese is a pretty good three-point shooting defending team, but they give up a lot of threes. They're willing to let teams shoot threes. So for Gonzaga, the key here, I guess, is not only to knock down open shots and knock down those threes when they get them, but to not be overly reliant on it. And I think when you when you talk about the changes that Gonzaga has made this season, entering Ben Gregg into the starting lineup, encouraging Graham E.K. to be more vocal, demanding the basketball, various other things. I think a big one is not being as reliant on that three-point shot. Don't just settle. Some things Gonzaga did was run that, that pick and roll a little closer to the basket so that if teams are sagging off Nembhard instead of it being a three-point shot, it is a mid-range jumper. He's much more consistent there. So finding ways to attack different holes in the defense that aren't just settling for threes because McNeese would love to force Gonzaga to beat him from three. Because the alternative is them defending the three-point line really well and giving Graham E.K. a bunch of room to operate. That's what Gonzaga wants. That's not what McNeese wants, whether they go zone, whether they run just a really packed-in offense, go constantly under every screen, packed-in defense, I mean, and, and go under those screens. We'll see what they try to do here, but they're going to try to make Gonzaga beat him from three. Gonzaga needs to be patient and get the shot that they want, but also, if you get open looks from three, knock them down. Key number four, control the pace. 
McNeese plays at a very slow pace, 282nd in the country, according to Ken Palm's tempo data. They're going to use pressure. They're going to pressure Gonzaga's guards. Gonzaga's needs to be able to handle that pressure, stay calm, get into their half-court offensive sets without constantly trying to push. You want Gonzaga to control the pace, but that does not mean forcing transition opportunities when they are not there. But it does mean on the other end of the ball, you want to speed them up. Whether that means Gonzaga is running that half-court trap, trying to get McNeese out of their comfort zone, whether it's running a full-court, three-quarter court press, we've seen Gonzaga do that. Make Don't let McNeese set up. It's kind of a similar thing we talk about when Gonzaga plays St. Mary's. Don't just let them get into their offense. Make them uncomfortable. If Gonzaga can force turnovers that way, and McNeese takes good care of the ball, again, uh, opponent quality I think plays a role there, but if Gonzaga can force turnovers or at least make McNeese not feel comfortable getting into their offense, I think that really helps Gonzaga be able to win this one. And then key number five, turn out the noise, tune out the noise. This is the first NCAA tournament game for Dusty Stromer and Braden Huff. It is also the second NCAA tournament game for Graham E.K. The first was a play-in game for Wyoming against Indiana that they lost. That was back in 2022. So this is new, new territory for E.K., new territory for Braden, new territory for Dusty Stromer. When Dusty Stromer and Braden Huff played their first ever road game against UW, they both struggled. You can't have them struggle here. You know, you, you don't need a big offensive game from Dusty Stromer. You don't need like 20 minutes from Braden Huff to win this game. You don't. If Braden Huff's playing 20 minutes, that's probably a bad sign because it means Graham E.K. is probably in foul trouble. That's not to say Braden Huff can't have a big impact on this game. He can, but what you need is you need that Braden Huff who's cool, calm, collected, who's you know getting the basketball and scoring right away, who's not committing dumb fouls on defense. Same situation with Dusty Stromer. This is their first NCAA tournament game. It's going to be loud. It's going to be packed. It's going to be a different feel, vibe, everything. You need those guys to tune out the noise, be calm, be cool, be collected. Fortunately, you have two guards who have been here before in Ryan Nampart and Nolan Hickman. Those guys need to set the tempo, control the pace, control everybody's emotions, and just get this team to execute their game plan. Because if Gonzaga executes what they want to do, if they set the pace, if they get the ball on the block, if they hit those open shots, they're winning this basketball game. Well, Thursday's slate includes a handful of games in Gonzaga's region, including, of course, Kansas and Samford. It also includes some big matchups outside of the Midwest region, including a matchup of former Gonzaga coaches between Tommy Lloyd and Dan Munson. We're going to talk about that and more after a word from today's sponsor, Nissan. Folks, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. Each week, we are picking one team that stands out, a team that has pushed it further than the rest. And just like all of the 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. That is the Rams of Colorado State. They can only be described as a Nissan Armada. This red hot team is as hardcore as it gets after going out there and blasting, bl folks blasting the Virginia Cavaliers held on to 14 points. Virginia went 51 consecutive minutes real time without scoring a single point. Colorado State now gets an opportunity to take on Texas. They are red hot. Can they keep bulldozing their way all the way into the Sweet 16? Folks, take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is also brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets, folks, because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the NCAA tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it is time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to spend on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who you think is going to win it all. Or if you want to pick Gonzaga to come out of that Midwest region, 850 to 1 odds right now. Those odds have decreased because of Kansas's injury to Kevin McCuller. So definitely get in on that action right now. You can visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. FanDuel an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, folks, segment two, still any patents, still locked on Zags. We're still looking at Thursday's slate of college basketball games in the first full day of the NCAA tournament. We're going to close out the show with some transfer portal targets. But for now, I want to talk about five games that are going on on Thursday that are not in Gonzaga's region. We're also going to speed by the games that are in Gonzaga's region for a more detailed conversation about the rest of 
of the Midwest region. Definitely check out Wednesday's show if you have not done so yet. We went through not only Gonzaga versus McNeese, we went through Kansas versus Samford, the potential second round matchup for the Zags, and then every other game, including Purdue, Utah State, Tennessee, Creighton, all of the good stuff there. But let's start with these five games that I've identified as like good games for Gonzaga fans to watch for a variety of reasons uh, here that are taking place on Thursday. We start with the BYU Cougars, former WCC opponent for the Zags, the sixth seed in the East region. They are taking on Duquesne, the Dukes, the winner of the Atlantic 10 Conference Tournament. Duquesne was the sixth seed in the A-10 Tournament, was not a at-large consideration whatsoever, not expected to be in this field here. They went on a nice run. The A-10, for those of you who missed this, all of the top four seeds lost on the same day. It was an absolutely bananas day in the A-10. Duquesne, the sixth seed, ends up winning the whole thing. They get a chance to take on BYU. This is 9.40 a.m., the second tip of the tournament on Thursday. It'll be on True TV. BYU favored by nine and a half. And look, BYU was kind of expected to get a five seed and, and really should have gotten a five seed. We talked about that on, I believe it was Tuesday's episode of Locked on Zags. If you missed that, uh, I won't go into all the detail, but effectively the way that BYU schedule lined up and the fact that they don't as an institution play on Sundays meant they had to get a six seed instead of a five seed. Part of the reason Gonzaga got bumped to a five seed, but let's see if, if BYU can prove it. Go win this game. Go beat Illinois in the second round, the three seed. That's, that's how you prove it. That's how you prove you belong on that six line. This is their first start for them. Be curious to see how they do against this Duquesne team. Then that second game teased this one earlier. Long Beach State, the 15 seed, taking on two-seeded Arizona. Dan Monson, the former head coach at Long Beach State, very odd to be saying that statement as he is still on the sidelines. He is still coaching this basketball team, but he has been relieved of his duties before the Big West tournament began. The way he responded to that was to take the 49ers and win the whole dang Big Big West tournament. They are now dancing, taking on Arizona. Monson was the head coach at Gonzaga in 98, 98 and 99. He actually hired Tommy Lloyd as a graduate, I believe it was a graduate assistant or a, an assistant job of some, of some kind, left before he got to work with Lloyd all that much. Lloyd, of course, stayed on to work with Mark Few. The rest is history. Spent 20 years working with Few on that staff. Now took that head coaching job at Arizona. Very fun to see Monson and Lloyd get an opportunity to coach against each other. The added oddity being that Dan Monson is not employed by the university that he is coaching. Really interesting stuff. Uh, I encourage you to go check out a great thread by Brenna Green on Twitter. She talked to Dan Monson during his media availability. He had some fantastic, funny, humorous quotes about the whole situation. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, that game is in Salt Lake City uh, at 11 a.m. on TBS. Arizona is favored by 19 and a half. I could see Dan keeping that one a little bit closer, although I still do expect the Wildcats to advance. Uh, next game, 10 Nevada versus 7 seed Dayton. Not really a strong Gonzaga connection here, other than I'm going to gripe a little bit about the, the committee's tendency to put two mid-major teams against each other in the first round. It often happens in these 7-9 games. Uh, I know Nevada, I mean, A-10 and Mountain West are two of the more prolific mid-major programs or, or mid-major conferences, I should say, and, and Nevada and, and Dayton are very excellent. They deserve to be seated where they are. I just wish that we got more opportunities to see mid-major teams play a power six team uh, and, and vice versa. Like I might I might like Florida versus Nevada as opposed to, and then, you know, Dayton getting a chance to take on like a, a 10-seated power team like Virginia if they had obviously advanced or Colorado if they advanced. Like, it's not. It's a. It's a small gripe. The main one that stands out to me was a few years ago. San Francisco finally makes the tournament first time in a long time. They play a seven seeded Murray State team. Murray State and San Francisco are not teams that get opportunities to play Power Six teams very often, and they squared them off against each other. Incredible overtime game was just a bummer that that was the matchup. This one. I don't feel as strongly about it, but it is kind of a bummer that these teams play each other. However, I expect Nevada, the lower seed here, to win, and I think Nevada is going to give Arizona and Tommy Lloyd a lot of trouble in that region as well. 14 seed Oakland takes on number three seed Kentucky. Obviously a chance for Gonzaga to see the team that they won that kind of helped turn their season around when they went to Rupp Arena to win that one. Can Kentucky avoid an early loss? This is something that has been an issue for John Calipari. Obviously the St. Peter's loss stands out a couple years ago. Uh, very talented the team, some bad losses on the resume. Curious to see how Kentucky does this year. And then you got number 10 Drake versus number seven Washington State. Technically not a battle of two mid-majors, although of course Wazoo is jumping into the WCC next season. I think that means we root for Kyle Smith and the Cougars. I do love this Drake team a lot though. Tucker DeVries is the sixth leading scorer in the country. They're starting power forward. His dad, Darian DeVries, is the head coach at Drake. Really fun Bulldogs team, but 
I love Kyle Smith, love the nerd ball that they play uh, for the Washington State. Excited to watch that game and see who comes out of that one with the W. Uh, the in-region games on Thursday, just going to speed by these again, more of an in-depth uh, analysis on these matchups on Wednesday's episode of Locked on Zags. Number six, South Carolina. Number 11, Oregon matchup of two teams we did not expect to see in the NCAA tournament. Uh, but Lamont Paris wins coach of the year for taking South Carolina from a last projected spot in the SEC. They were projected to finish last uh, in the regular season. They end up finishing tied for second. Uh, three seed Creighton, 14 seed Akron. I expect Creighton to advance here. I think there's a chance if Gonzaga can do uh, some serious work. We could see a Creighton-Gonzaga matchup in the Elite Eight. How fun would that be? Yes, it would require Gonzaga to beat Purdue or somebody to beat Purdue. Yes, it would require Creighton to beat Tennessee, but a Ryan Nemhard matchup between Gonzaga and Creighton. Boy, would that be fun. It starts with Creighton taking on Akron at 10.30 on Thursday on TNT. And then Texas versus Colorado State. We know officially now that it is Colorado State. I said on the show on Wednesday, I recorded before the game, I said I think there's a chance Colorado State blows out Virginia. Boy, howdy, did that come true. Virginia, 14 points in the first half, an embarrassing showing for Tony Bennett's team in the NCAA tournament. Meanwhile, Colorado State, I expect them to advance past Texas. I have not been a big fan of this Texas team. They're healthier now than they were earlier in the year. Max A. Smith is a phenomenal scorer, one of the 30 30- most prolific scorers in college basketball history in terms of total points. But I I like this Colorado State team a lot, and I think there's a real chance that they advance here and take on Tennessee, who is taking on St. Peter's. That game will be at 620 on TNT. Uh, Texas Colorado State is the one before that at 350. Vols are hoping to make their first ever Final Four. First up, they got to get by the Peacocks of St. Peter's, a team that, of course, beat a two-seeded team in the SEC back in 2022 when they beat Kentucky as a 15 seed. If they can do it again, it'll be one of college basketball's greatest stories of all time. Something tells me that Dalton Connect, the uh, player of the year candidate from Tennessee, transfer from Northern Colorado, has got something to say about it and is going to do enough work to keep Tennessee from suffering that kind of loss. Well, like I said, Coaching staff splitting time talking about transfer portal and the NCAA tournament. So am I. So we're going to talk about Gonzaga, who contacted an extremely talented point guard who entered the portal out of Stanford. We got more on what that could mean for Mark Few's team. Coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Amazon Fire TV. Folks, Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. And Fire TV offers amazing video experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV and provides you access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's March Madness or opening weekend of the Major League Baseball season, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. We have Amazon Fire Sticks on every TV in our house because I love the layout. I like the user experience. The remote is also super handy. It has buttons that take you to Disney+, Plus, Prime, Netflix, and Hulu. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels, which deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands for free. And that includes us at Locked On. Go check out the Fire TV channels. You can watch Locked On Zags, Locked On College Basketball, whatever other Locked On shows you like for free on those Fire TV channels. Uh, you also let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep Keep you up to date on everything going on in the world wide world of sports. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. All right, folks, closing out the show today, talking about the transfer portal. It officially opened on Monday, the day after selection, Sunday, March 18th. Recording this now in the evening on March 20th, less than 48 hours later, there are well over 300. I think by this point, we might be at 500, at least close to it, players who have already entered the transfer portal, many of them coming from programs where their coach has already been fired. That is understandable. We'll talk about some Stanford players here. Jared Haas let go, some UW players in the portal after Mike Hopkins let go. We addressed earlier that there's four or five different players from Pepperdine who have entered the transfer portal uh, after, of course, Lorenzo Romar was let go. So you kind of understand why players are leaving if their coach who recruited them is no longer there, but still very surprising. I mean, not surprising, just unusual 
something we're getting used to is that the off season is starting before the NCAA tournament. And it's just bizarre. And it's, it's, it's an unusual place to be in college athletics. So we know that Gonzaga has contacted a handful of players. We talked about two of them, uh, Marcus Cruz and Jacob. Yes. Marcus Foster, excuse me. And Jacob Cruz. Uh, we talked about them earlier this week. I think that was on Monday's show today. A couple more guys that have been, have reported that Gonzaga has contacted them. And I mentioned this on that Monday show when you hear that a player is reporting that they heard from a team, it, it could mean so many different things. And so I think reading too far into it until we know more is silly. If a player says, hey, I heard from Gonzaga, and then he lists 15 other schools, that might just mean he got a text from Coach Stephen Gentry. If he says, hey, there's three programs I'm considering and one of them is Gonzaga, that's maybe a little bit different. If you hear, hey, this player was on Gonzaga's campus, that's a lot different. That's what happened with Ryan Nembhard and Graham E.K. And boom, they both connected, uh, uh, c- committed Excuse me, on the same day. So you got to take the, the language here with a bit of a grain of salt. But two players that have reported Gonzaga contacted them, Roger McFarland and Kanan Carlisle. We'll start with Carlisle, Carlisle, excuse me, six foot three point guard from Stanford. He was a freshman last year, 11 and a half points per game, 2.7 assists, 2.7 boards, only shot 32% from three, but he was a top 50 prospect coming out of high school, went to overtime elite before joining the Cardinal reportedly has also heard from a litany of big time programs, including Gonzaga, Indiana, Baylor, Georgia, Oklahoma, Arkansas, expect to see Arkansas on every single one of these lists, by the way, Eric Musselman loves the transfer portal more than anybody I know. Uh, and also Damon Stoudemire and Georgia tech. Carlisle's a phenomenal player. I'm, not super concerned about the low three-point shooting. We've talked about this a lot. Those of you who are new listeners this season, you will hear this phrase a lot over the off season. If you are an everyday listener, Ryan Woolridge effect, what it means players who transfer to Gonzaga, particularly when they came from programs where they had a bigger offensive role and are coming into Gonzaga's offense where their role is less. We see their efficiency tick up. Ryan Woolridge spent three years at North, North Texas shooting 32% from three. He shot 42% at Gonzaga. This has applied to Malachi Smith. This has applied to uh, to Rasir Bolton. This has applied to a handful of other players who have transferred to Gonzaga and seen their efficiency numbers uptick. Kanan Carlisle could be the next player in that list. We'll talk about Roger McFarland. McFarland is a six foot five grad transfer from Southeast Louisiana. Same conference, the Southland as McNeese. McFarland averaged about 15 points, eight and a half boards, one and a half assists, shot about 34% from three. The list of schools he has heard from is huge. And that's why I say we take this with a grain of salt because I think programs like UNCW, New Mexico State, and South Alabama, which are all on this list, probably have a bigger vested interest in trying to land somebody than like Roger McFarland than programs like let's say Memphis or Florida State or UCF or Florida Atlantic or Cal or Murray State with the rest of the list, UMass, George Washington, Middle Tennessee State, SF Austin, and Marshall. Lots of schools involved here. Gonzaga is the most notable of the bunch outside of maybe FSU and Memphis. Uh, Again, don't know what that means necessarily. RJ Barsh has has got a lot of connections to Florida. Uh, McFarland plays in Southeast Louisiana. A lot of Florida schools are involved here. Could just be as simple as that, but definitely a name to at least keep on the radar as we get into the transfer portal season. Another name I think Gonzaga fans should have on the radar, even though he has not been directly connected to Gonzaga yet, is Kanan Carlisle's teammate at Stanford, Andrei Stoyakovich. If the Stoyakovich last name sounds familiar to you, I know there's a Gonzaga fan out there on Twitter who is a huge Sacramento Kings fan, so shout out to him. Peja Stoyakovich, his son, Andrej, phenomenal player, Stoyakovich. The elder Stoyakovich was an NBA all-star, really, really good outside shooter for those or those really good Sacramento Kings teams about 20 years ago. Uh, Andrej shot not very good at Stanford last year, under 33% from three, wasn't a particularly good finisher. It was kind of a, a, a struggle of a freshman year for Stoyakovich, under eight points per game, about three and a half boards. Again, not very efficient offensively, but he was a top 25 prospect in that 2023 class. Schools like Kansas had offers to him. Kentucky had an offer to him. Uh, Oregon had an offer out to him. Lots of really, really big name programs had offers out to Stoyakovich. He goes to Stanford. He's in the portal after one year. He's a six foot seven wing, really smooth shooting stroke. I think he needs a little bit more development and I could see Gonzaga getting involved. It's tough because the expectation, barring a, a surprise transfer decision, is that both Steel Venters and Dusty Stromer will be back next year. They're both six foot seven wings. Where do you fit Stoyakovich in? Do you feel he can play the two? Do you feel Steele can play the two? Like it's maybe not a perfect fit on the roster necessarily, but he's a, he's a player you got to at least give a call to because I think the upside for Stoyakovich is tremendous. A couple other guys to keep in mind for Gonzaga: Corin Johnson, 
transfer from the University of Washington. He's from the Seattle area. He went to Wasatch Academy, the same high school as Nolan Hickman, who is also a six foot two point guard from Seattle. A lot of similarities between those two guys. Johnson averaged 11 points, two and a half assists, assist, shot 37% from three for the Huskies. Michael Ajayi, we talked about him already, one of the three transfers out of Pepperdine. He is from the Seattle area. He averaged 17 and 10 and was first team all WCC this year. You don't see a lot of players transfer within the WCC to Gonzaga, but Ajayi definitely makes some sense as a bigger body guard who can shoot the ball the way that he can. And then I wanted to mention Houston Millette because he's one of the more interesting stories in college hoops right now because he committed to Alabama. Houston Millette also the point guard at Pepperdine alongside Michael Ajayi, alongside Javon Porter, who's also in the portal. Uh, but Millette's already committed. He committed to Alabama. Alabama has yet, has yet to play their first NCAA tournament game. They're taking on Charleston, the 13th seed on Friday, and yet they're already adding players in the portal. Now, for pe- I think a lot of people are like, oh, what is this going to do for team chemistry? Look, Mark Sears and Aaron Estrada, the two starting guards for Alabama, are both fifth-year seniors. They cannot return. So I think adding a player in the portal when that is the situation feels less, we'll say, icky, for lack of a better word. Like I think if you're adding players in the portal and they're going to clearly replace players who are currently on your roster while your team is still playing, that's just a bad judgment. Now, nobody here is going to say that Nate Oates is a paragon of not making bad judgment calls because he has done that in the past, but this feels less less problematic because of the fact that Alabama has some clear and obvious holes on next year's roster that Millette can fill. Still a weird situation we're in where roster moves are happening before the NCAA tournament, not before the NCAA tournament finishes, before it even really gets started. It's just a bizarre time in college hoops. That's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. The next time we talk, Gonzaga will have played McNeese State. Hopefully we'll be talking about a win and getting y'all ready for a game on Saturday against either Kansas or Samford. We'll be back then getting you all ready for the rest of the weekend. Until then, as always, go Zags.